So uh, let's, let's get started. Uh, welcome to our conference on monetary policy, which has became a, become a tradition, which we're very happy uh, people are paying attention more and more. And um, uh, I want to just uh, a, a few things. There's lots of books and things to pick out and papers that are related to the conference, some of our previous publications from former conferences. So please do that. The, uh, the sessions here and at lunch will be uh, live streamed and available on YouTube, so just be aware of that. Uh, we hope to have a good discussion and uh, good commentary uh, throughout, so, so there'll be plenty of time for you to all participate. And this is a participatory thing, it's not, not only the speakers. So I'm very happy to introduce my good friend Rich Clarida. It's a terrific way to start this conference off, and uh, we're honored that the Vice Chair of the Fed can speak to us. Uh, Rich has been part of this conference series since its very start, and uh, we originally put it in a journal, Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control, and the title of the paper and speech, you remember this? I do. Monetary Policy and Open Economies, Practical Perspectives for Pragmatic Central Bankers. So we're going to hear about from, <laughs> from a pragmatic central banker. And then just uh, two years ago, um, beautiful piece, uh, National Monetary Policies Often Correlate, May Sometimes Coordinate, But Rarely Cooperate. And that's probably a good thing. So it's a <laughs> terrific titles and terrific... Uh, speeches. So we're just delighted uh, Rich can start us off. We have talked a lot about this year as a time which is special because the Federal Reserve itself is undergoing a review and of various things and communication strategies and tools. So we have the word strategies in our title this year uh, to somehow emphasize that link. It's not a formal link by any means, but we want to be as supportive as possible. And uh, Sean Cochran and Michael Bordeaux, others who helped us get this going, uh, we've always thought about that. I've talked to, to Jim Bullard from, from time to time. So it's been very important that we're supportive of what the Fed is doing. And so it's particularly nice that uh, Rich Claret, who's chairing the review in some sense, is going to start us off. So we'll have a little time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, Rich has uh, agreed to do that, so think of some uh, good questions. And in the meantime, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Tom. John, thank you for that introduction. And uh, <coughs> the Hoover Monetary Conference is always a um, highlight on my schedule. <coughs> So I'm very pleased uh, to be able to participate this year bright and early uh, on, this, on this Friday. And I'm joined today, I should say, by my wife, Polly, and my son, Russell. So it's a real treat uh, to be able to present in front of them as well. The topic of this year's conference is strategies for monetary policy. Um, and that's especially timely. As you know, the Fed is conducting a review of the strategy tools and communications practices that we deploy to pursue our dual mandate goals of maximum employment and price stability. In this review, we expect to benefit from the insights and perspectives that are presented today, as well as those that are offered at other conferences that are devoted to this topic, as we assess possible ways in which we might refine our existing monetary policy framework to better achieve our dual mandate goals on a sustained basis. My talk today, however, will not be devoted to a broad view of the Fed's monetary policy framework because that process is ongoing and I would not want to prejudge the outcome. But my talk today will instead focus on some of the important ways in which economic models and financial market signals helped me to think about conducting monetary policy and practice after a career of thinking about it in theory. Let me set the scene with a very brief and certainly selective review of the evolu evolution over the past several decades of professional thinking about monetary policy. 
I will begin with Milton Friedman's landmark 1967 AEA presidential address, The Role of Monetary Policy. Now this article is, of course, most famous for its message that there is no long run exploitable trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And in this paper, Friedman introduced the concept of the natural rate of unemployment, what we today call U star. What is less widely appreciated in this article is that Friedman also paper also contains a very concise but insightful discussion of Vixel's natural rate of interest, what we call R star today, the real interest rate that is consistent with price stability. But while U star and R star provide key reference points in Friedman's framework for assessing how far the economy may be from its long run equilibrium, they play absolutely no role in the monetary policy that he advocates. His well known K percent rule that central banks should aim for and deliver a constant rate of growth of a monetary aggregate. This simple rule, Friedman believed, could deliver long run price stability without requiring the central bank to take a stand on, to model, or to estimate either R star or U star. Friedman acknowledged specifically that shocks, of course, would push U away from U star and R away from R star, but Friedman felt that the role of monetary policy was to operate with a simple quantity rule that did not itself introduce potential instability into the process by which the economy on its own would converge to U star and R star. In other words, in Friedman's policy framework, U star and R star are economic destinations. They are not policy rule inputs. Now, of course, I do not need to elaborate for this audience at Hoover that the history of K percent rules is that they were rarely tried and when they were tried in the 70s and 80s, they were found to work much better in theory than in practice. Velocity relationships proved to be empirically unstable, and there was often only a very loose connection between the growth rate of, a monetary, of the monetary base, which the central bank, of course, can control, and the growth rate of the broader monetary aggregates. Moreover, the macroeconomic priority in the 1980s in the US the UK and other countries was to do whatever it takes to break the back of inflation and to restore the credibility squandered by central banks that had been unable or unwilling to provide a nominal anchor after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. And many of us began our careers during that time. By the early 1990s, the back of inflation had been broken. Thank you, Paul Volcker. And conditions for price stability had been achieved. Thank you, Alan Greenspan. And the time was right for something to fill the vacuum in central bank practice left by the realization that monetary aggregate ta targeting was not in practice a workable policy framework. Although it was mostly unspoken, there was a growing sense at the time that a simple systematic framework for central bank practice was needed to ensure that the hard won gains from breaking the back of inflation were not given away by short sighted discretionary monetary policy experiments that were poorly executed, such had been the case in the 1970s and 80s. Now, that vacuum, of course, was filled by John Taylor in his classic 1993 paper, Discretion versus Policy Rules in Practice. Now, again, for this audience, I will not need to remind you of the enormous impact this single paper had not only on the field of monetary economics, but also and more importantly on the practice of monetary policy. For our purposes today, I will note that a crucial insight of John's paper <coughs> was that whereas a central bank could pick the K in the K percent rule on its own without any reference to the underlying parameters of the economy, a well-designed rule for setting a short-term interest rate, such as a policy instrument rule, should, John argued, respect several requirements. First, the rule should anchor the nominal policy rate at a, a level equal to the sum of its estimate of R star, the neutral rate, plus the inflation target. And yes, John's paper is an inflation targeting paper. That's what the pi star is. Second, to achieve this nominal anchor, the central bank should be prepared to raise the nominal policy rate by more than one for one when inflation exceeds the target, what Woodford has christened the Taylor principle. 
And third, the central bank should lean against the win when output or via an Oaken's Law relationship, the unemployment rate deviates from its potential of U star. In other words, whereas in Friedman's K percent policy rule, U star and R star are destinations irrelevant to the choice of K, in the Taylor rule and most subsequent Taylor type rules, U star and R star are necessary inputs, and Mike Woodford establishes this in his treatise. In Woodford 03, he demonstrates theoretically that the first two requirements for a Taylor type rule are necessary for it to be consistent with the objective of price stability. The third requirement that monetary policy lean against the wind in response to an output or unemployment gap not only theoretically contributes to the objective of price stability, but is also obviously desirable from the perspective of a central bank like the Federal Reserve that has an explicit dual mandate. The Taylor approach to instrument rule specification has been found to produce good macroeconomic outcomes across a wide range of macroeconomic models, and that's no small feat. Moreover, in a broad class of both closed and open economy DSGE models, Taylor type rules can be shown to be optimal given the underlying foundations of these models. Now, in original formulations of Taylor type rule, R star was treated as constant and potential output was set equal to the CBO estimate of potential output or their estimate of, the, um, of U star. These assumptions were eminently reasonable at the time, and I myself wrote a number of papers with co-authors in the years uh, before the financial crisis that, that incorporated them. And indeed, subsequent work shows that they indeed make sense during that period. Now, fast forward to today. At each uh, FOMC meeting, uh, my colleagues and I consult potential policy rate paths implied by a number of policy rules as we assess what adjustments, if any, may be required for the stance of monetary policy to achieve and maintain our dual mandate objectives. A presentation and discussion of several of these rules has been included in the semi-annual monetary policy report to Congress since July of 2017. The one thing I have come to appreciate is that as I assess the benefits and costs of alternative uh, policy scenarios based on a set of policy rules and economic projections, it is important to recognize upfront that key inputs to this assessment, including U star and R star, are unobservable and must be inferred from data via models. I would now like to discuss how I incorporate such considerations into thinking about how to choose among monetary policy alternatives. I'm speaking just for myself. A monetary policy strategy must find a way to combine incoming data and a model of the economy with a healthy dose of judgment and humility to formulate and then communicate a path for the policy rate most consistent with the central bank's objectives. Now there are two distinct ways in which I think that the path for the federal funds rate should be data dependent. Monetary policy should be data dependent in the sense that incoming data reveal at any point in time where the economy is relative to the ultimate objectives of price stability and maximum employment. This information on where the economy is relative to the goals of policy is an important input into interest rate feedback rules. After all, feedback rules have to feed back on something. Data dependence in this sense is well understood as it is of the type implied by a large family of policy rules, including Taylor type rules, in which the parameters of the economy needed to formulate such rules may be taken as known. But of course, at least two key parameters needed to formulate such rules, including U star and R star, are unknown. And as a result, in the real world, monetary policy should be, and the US, I believe, is data dependent in a second sense. Policymakers should and do study incoming data and use models to extract signals that enable them to update and improve their estimates of R star and U star. As indicated in the summary of economic projections, FOMC participants have, over the past seven years, repeatedly revised down their estimates of both U star and R star as unemployment fell and as real interest rates remained well below prior estimates of neutral without the rise in inflation those earlier estimates might have predicted. And these revisions to U star and R star appear to have had an important influence on the path for the policy rate actually implemented by the committee, of course, I was not there at the time, just arriving in September of last year. One could, I 
suppose, interpret any change in the conduct of policy as a shift in a central bank's reaction function. But in my view, when such changes result from revised estimates of U star or R star, they merely reflect an updating of an existing reaction function. Now, in addition to U star and R star, another important input into any monetary policy assessment is the state of inflation expectations. <clears throat> Since the 1990s, inflation expectations appear to have been stable and are often said to be well anchored. However, inflation expectations are not directly observable. They must be inferred from models, other macroeconomic information, market prices, and surveys. Longer term inflation expectations that are anchored materially above or below 2% present a risk to price stability as the Fed has defined it. <clears throat> For this reason, policymakers should and do study incoming data to extract signals that can be used to update and improve estimates of expected inflation. Now in many theoretical rational expectations models, expected inflation is anchored at the target by assumption. So from a risk management perspective, it makes sense, I believe, to regularly test this assumption against empirical evidence. Now, because the true model of the economy is unknown, either because the structure is unknown or because the parameters of a known structure are evolving, I believe policymakers should consult a number and variety of sources of information about neutral real interest rates and expected inflation, to name just two key macroeconomic variables. Because macroeconomic models of R star and inflation expectations are potentially misspecified, seeking out other sources of information that are not derived from the same models can be especially useful. To be sure, financial market signals are inevitably noisy and day-to-day -day movements in asset prices are unlikely to tell us much about the position of the economy. However, persistent shifts in financial market conditions can be informative and signals derived from financial market data, along with surveys of households, firms, and market participants, can be an important complement to estimates obtained from historically estimated and calibrated macroeconomic models. Interest rate futures and interest rate swap markets provide one source of high frequency information about the path and destination for the federal funds rate expected by market participants. And interest rate options markets, under certain assumptions, can offer insights about the entire ex ante probability distribution of policy rate outcomes. And indeed, one reads that a future policy decision by the Fed is, quote, fully priced in. This is usually based on a straight read of futures or options prices. But the signals from interest rate derivatives markets are only a pure measure of expected policy under the assumption of a zero risk premium. For this reason, it's useful to compare policy rate paths derived from market prices with the path obtained from surveys of market participants, which, while subject to measurement error, should not be contaminated with a term premium. Market and survey-based estimates of the policy rate path are often highly correlated and positively correlated, but when there is a divergence between the path for the policy rate implied by surveys and a straight read of interest rate derivative prices, I, I myself place at least as much weight on the surveys as I do the estimates obtained from market prices. The Treasury yield curve can provide another source of information about the expected path and the ultimate long run destination for the policy rate. But again, the yield curve, like interest rate futures, reflects not only expectations of the path for rates, but also liquidity, liquidity and term premium factors. Thus, to extract signal, from signal about policy from noise in the yield curve, a term structure model is required. But different term structure models can indeed and do produce different estimates of the expected path for the policy rate and the term premium. Moreover, fluctuations in the term premium on U.S. Treasury yields are driven in part by a significant global factor, which complicates efforts to treat the slope of the yield curve as a sufficient statistic for the expected path of U.S. monetary policy. Again here, surveys of market participants can provide a useful set of information, for example, about the expected average federal funds rate over the next 10 years, which provide an alternative way to identify term premium components in the U.S. Treasury yield. 
Quotes from the Treasury Inflation Protection Securities Market, the TIPS market, can also provide valuable information about two key inputs to monetary policy, long-run R-star and expected inflation. Direct reads of TIPS rates and forward rates are signals of the level of real rates that investors expect at various horizons and that can be used to complement model-based estimates of R-star. In addition, TIPS market data can uh, combined with nominal treasury yields can be used to construct measures of break-even inflation, which provide a noisy signal of market expectations of future inflation. But again, a straight read of break-even inflation needs to be augmented with a model to filter out the liquidity and risk premium components that place a wedge between inflation compensation and expected inflation. As is the case with the yield curve, <clears throat> it is useful to compare estimates of expected inflation derived from financial markets with estimates of expected inflation obtained from surveys. For example, the, the University of Michigan survey of consumers. Market and survey-based estimates of expected inflation are correlated and positively, but again, when there's a divergence between the two, I place at least as much weight on the surveys as I do the market-derived estimates. Now the examples that I have mentioned illustrate a very important point that in practice, there is not a clean distinction between model-based and market-based inferences of key economic variables, such as R star and expected inflation. The reason is that market replaces reflect not only market expectations, but also risk and liquidity of premium that need to be filtered out to recover the object of interest. But this filtering almost always requires a model of some sort so even market-based estimates of key inputs to policy are to some extent model dependent. Let me conclude with some implications of this for monetary policy. Macroeconomic models are, of course, an essential tool for monetary policy analysis. But the structure of the economy evolves, and the policy framework must be, and I believe is, at the Federal Reserve, nimble enough to respect this evolution. While financial market signals can and sometimes do provide a reality check on the predictions of a model gone astray, market prices are at best noisy signals of macroeconomic variables of interest, and the process of filtering out the noise itself requires a model and hopefully some good judgment. Survey estimates of long-run destination for key policy inputs can and do complement the predictions for macro models and market prices. Now, yes, the Fed's job would be much easier if the real world of 2019 satisfied the requirements to run Friedman's K% percent policy rule. But it does not and has not for at least 50 years, and our policy framework must and does reflect this reality. Now, this reality includes the fact that the U.S. economy is in a very good place. The unemployment rate is at a 50-year low. Real wages are rising in line with productivity. Inflationary pressures are muted, and expected inflation is stable. Moreover, the federal funds rate is now in the range of estimates of its longer-run neutral level, and the unemployment rate is not that far below many estimates of U star. Plugging these estimates into a 1993 Taylor rule can provide a federal funds rate that is very close to our current target range for the policy rate. So with the economy operating at or very close to the Fed's dual mandate objectives, and with a policy rate in the range of the committee's estimates of its neutral level, we can, I believe, afford to be data dependent in both senses of the term, as I have defined it, as we assess what of any further adjustments in our policy stance may be required to maintain our dual mandate objectives and maximum employment and price stability. Thank you very much. So uh, the vice chair has agreed to answer a few questions, uh, if you have any. So I'll, I'll call on you, and I might have some myself. Michael Bordeaux here. Hey, Rich. Um, Hi. So <clears throat> my question is about the concept of data dependence. It seems pretty close to what <clears throat> Ben Bernanke and Rick Mishkin called constrained discretion a few years ago. And so the question is, is, um, is where do you draw the line between the constrained part, which could be like rule-like, you know, what you call yeah. rule-like behavior, 
and discretion, which could be looking at everything or, you know, fine tuning. So, I, so the real question is where, like, how do you make that decision? It's a great point, and I and I agree. It would it would be easier if um, if U star and R star didn't didn't move around. Um, and so I, d I do agree with you. There needs to be a discipline there, and I think the ultimate discipline on the Fed or any central bank is the um, is whether or not we do achieve and maintain our objectives. So if a central bank consistently gets R star and U star wrong and inflation moves up as it did in the 70s, then then cons discretion is not serving uh, well. But but I do believe that the that what what focuses the, the Fed and other successful central banks is they're being evaluated on achieving their objectives. And of course, not only actual, but you know, expected inflation is also a key element of, of this. So I think that is, in reality, that is the check that, that we need to respect and that we do respect. One of, uh, let me, one of the things that um, I found very interesting about your remarks is that there's not only a strategy or rule, there's a, a way to determine the U star and R star. And I think sometimes uh, one gets concerned that so much focus on U star and R star that tends to dominate, and it's sort of it's the, the fluctuations in those are bigger than yeah. any kind of rule. So, could you, and I think you're trying to prevent that, but you, could you comment a bit on that? You're right, and I think that that was why I wanted to devote my remarks today to that because I think that that's a central issue that faces the Fed and other um, central banks. Is it, it would be irresponsible to ignore the evolution of the economy. But also, there, you, you require, there, there, you certainly need a check and a discipline and an approach to doing that, which is why I suggested in my talk, speaking for myself, I don't want to put all my eggs in a, either the basket of a theoretical model or, or market prices, so I'm constantly checking back and forth. And so I think you need, I think you need kind of a, a, a both. And as I mentioned in response to Mike's question, the, ult the ultimate discipline is is the outcomes achieved, both in terms of inflation and in the case of the Fed as a dual mandate. And here, inflation expectations are also key. So, you know, if, John, when you and I began our uh, careers in the 70s and 80s, if we'd had data on tips, I'm sure in the 70s they would have shown expected inflation was not two, it was 14. I, I would have hoped that, that you and I would have paid attention to that then. So I think that's, that's where the market pricing comes in as well. Right here. Hi, I'm Chris Crow. Um, you said um, that you saw the economy in a, in a good place right now, and it's, it's hard to disagree with that in the short term. But if you look sort of historically, um, it's quite typical, you know, when the unemployment rate is, is this low, um, that within a year or two, you know, the economy te is, can be in a not so such a good place, you know, heading towards recession. Um, do you see any risks in that direction right now? And, you know, if, if not, you know, what's different this time around? Well, obviously, policy needs to be forward-looking. So, uh, you know, decisions that a central bank made, makes today need to depend upon the view that it has about the evolution of the economy. Long and variable lags, as, as Friedman you know, taught us. And of course, you know, at the Federal Reserve, we we are very focused on uh, looking at a wide range of indicators about trends in labor markets, in in in, in goods markets. Um, and in you know, financial market-based estimates of, of, of surveys. So we, we do not see that evidence now, but in any economy, it's evolving in a stochastic fashion. There are gonna be upside and downside risk on that path, and, and central banks need to be vigilant and alert to both, both sides of those, both sides of those, those, those risks. Uh, Charlie Plosser, and then Christian. Thank you, Rich, for a great, great, great talk. I enjoyed it very much. I, I want to follow up on Mike Bordeaux's question just uh -huh. a little bit. And I, I believe you're right. The ultimate test is does the Fed meet its mandate and its goals uh, is the ultimate test. And one of the things that Milton would have argued, I think, on, with his K percent rule, but it's more than just meeting the goals. It's about the instability and uncertainty created within the economy. Yeah. So you didn't mention that part of it. And so you could say you might ask the question, well, is the Fed meeting its goal, but at the same time, there's a question of volatility or instability or uncertainty that can be created in the policy reaction function yeah. or how are the, the, or the discretion that's being exercised. Yeah. So how do you think about that? Because that's kind of like, you know, um, uh, the counterfactual that yeah. are you introducing more instability yeah. uh, than might be necessary by the discretionary 
part of the of your view. That well, I just wanted to. And I understand, that. and indeed, I, I I did make reference in my prepared remarks to Friedman's case for the K percent rule was sort of the Hippocratic oath to do no harm, and I'm certainly I and I think my colleagues keep that in mind as well. But again, with the discipline that we have to deal and implement policy in the world as we find it, not as in the world that you know Friedman assumed. That being said, certainly uh, none of us wants to, nor do we believe that we are a source of instability, but clearly that is, that's an important uh, discipline that we need to respect. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so, Rich, you, in your discussion, you talked about the importance of you know, uh, filtering for risk premium and so on when we're extracting signals yeah. about expectations in financial markets. But I wanted to ask you about the risk premium themselves. So, if we were to observe, which I think we have observed, persistent negative term premium, and specifically persistent negative inflation risk premium, suggestive that financial market participants see a need to insure against the low inflation state. Right. What would the implications of that be for policy? Would it suggest the rule or framework needs to be reconsidered? Or could you imagine that you were conducting policy appropriately uh, and the equilibrium condition was still a sizable negative inflation risk premium? Well, so I think there are so several pieces to that, Krishna. Fir first of all, yes, the, we and, and you do consult those indicators of those of those tail risks, but those are all, as you appreciate, those are all model specific because they a little wonkish here. You have to specify the stochastic disc fac discount factor and risk neutral pricing. So yes, we we are alert to that. I think more generally, though, the way I I think the essence of your question that's relevant for the Fed and other central banks is. Um, because we're operating in a, in a world of low riskless rates, a low R-star world, and it is a global phenomenon, and that's a factor that impinges on the U.S., the fact that, that you have very, very low riskless rates in, in many other advanced countries. Clearly, with a global capital market, it's going to have an influence uh, here. Um, and so I do think that central banks need, need to be alert that, that, you know, closer to the zero bound, you're, for any given probability of shocks, you're more likely to hit it, and that does need to factor into the way that we think about the evolution of, of, of policy. But I don't think in a, in a mechanical way, as I'm not sure, I'm sure you weren't suggesting. Uh, Sebastian? Thank you. Hi, Rich. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian Edwards. Um, I want to follow up on uh, what you just uh, uh, said right now. So uh, those of us who follow the market uh, and the macro uh, 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 picture, uh, we listen very carefully to what the chairman says, to what you say, your colleagues say, but we also listen to uh, Mario Draghi and to Mark Carney and to uh, the, we, we look at the international picture. And until your answer to the previous question, you had sort of ignored that. And I know that you have done a lot of work on the subject. So is there information out there in the currency markets and yeah. in the, I mean, the, the, the whole idea of the open economy, uh, John mentioned your paper from a few years back, monetary policy in open and closed economies. And your talk, from my perspective, was very US-centered, which is right for the vice chairman. But what about the well, signals that come from the open economy? A little little self-promotion. So I gave a speech at the Banque de France conference about a month ago on called Global, Global Considerations for US Monetary Policy. So I, I will send you that. There's an entire speech, speech uh, an entire speech on that. Um, and, and I did mention in my remarks, and certainly in my professional career, was devoted to this. There's, you know, a lot of a, a lot of U.S. asset prices have an, a substantial global component, both as predicted by economic theory and empirical um, evidence. And so, certainly, when I start talk, talking about market prices, especially for for, for bond yields, uh, there's a very substantial global component that one needs to sort out. And it's just simply not the case that either the slope or the level of the U.S. yield curve by itself is a sufficient statistic for the outlook for the U.S. And so, but that's, that was another speech, but I can. Okay, there's two more questions here and then there. Um, hi. So uh, long-term inflation expectations um, obviously are playing a key role in all of this framework discussion. And you can imagine if you had a, a good measure of them, uh, they would play a huge role in terms of measuring the accountability of the central bank, and even as a variable that could be in your reaction function. Now, as you noted, we don't have good measures of them. It's very complicated to extract signals from markets. Uh, 
interpret surveys correctly, and there's a whole set of information. But I guess I wanted to ask, do you think we could do better than just saying, well, we don't measure them very well? I mean, would there be an advantage to the Fed actually stating what its best reading is at any point in time of where long-term inflation expectations are, taking into account all these signals? Like, what's your best guess? And you know, maybe that would deliver some accountability and, and the chance to actually be systematic in terms of how policy responds to that. So I'm just curious if... No, I, th I, think, I think it's an excellent point. What I, what I would say, and I think, um, um, I think Bob Rubin and Larry Summers deserve a lot of credit for actually introducing the TIPS market, because for all of its flaws and all of its problems, I think we're much better off as, as policymakers looking at those noisy signals than having zero signals. So I, my own sense is is there's no unique signal of inflation expectations as there is for an absolute price index, a PC index. So I think the reality is you're always going to be comparing signals from different um, uh, sources, you know, and, and whether or not one could come up with an ideal or index of weighting those is, you know, certainly something I haven't thought of, but, you know, it's certainly something worth, I think, worth thinking about. Uh, last question, John Cochran. Hi, John Cochran. Hi, John. That was a great talk. Uh, thank you. Um, it's hard to go wrong when you Milton mention Milton Friedman and John Taylor six times in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you're, you're willing to go on to uh, ways we have learned beyond uh, what Milton taught. It's not eternal verities. We're all data dependent in a way. And, and I like the historical uh, way you started, which I, I'd, I'd put as, um, you know, once we went to Taylor Rule in the 1990s, U star and R star were sort of fixed numbers, and we've learned that they move over time which are, in s the other way, language for that is we used to think everything, well, we, the Fed used to think everything was demand, and now, gee, maybe what we could loosely call supply moves around. Um, but there still seems to be a, a, uh, an assumption that these things move very slowly through time. Uh, whereas, in fact, I think today's challenge is that maybe U star, R star, and potential GDP move much more quickly than we thought. Uh, we have with us the father of real business cycle theory, Ed Prescott, in the room, who, who showed us that, in fact, a lot of variation can come from supply. And that's the Fed's central problem. Output goes up this quarter. Was that demand that we need to offset, or was that supply, which is just fine? And in thinking about it, we, the Fed doesn't do much modeling of what is the changes of incentives in the tax code, what is the effects of deregulation, to what extent are we seeing high frequency changes in supply? And it's the elephant in the room. The Wall Street Journal, uh, today's op-ed, took the Fed to task for not thinking enough about whether even shorter term fluctuations are supply potential stars rather than signals of demand to be offset. So where do you think that that's going? Should we be moving more in that direction or is, is the current progress satisfactory? Well, I, I don't think whenever, to an academic audience wants to say progress is satisfactory so we can do better. But, but certainly, John, you know, in my six or seven months as Fed Vice Chair and a number of my public remarks, I've tried to emphasize the supply side. And you just, you have to look at the data. You know, labor force participation is part of supply. Productivity is part of, of, of supply. Um, and, you know, I think it's certainly something that we discuss extensively in our um, in, in, in our meeting, so I can and assure you it's not something that's ig ignored in the uh, ECHLs. Thank you so much, uh, Rich. This is terrific. Yeah. So we're going to go directly to the next session with uh, Ken Rogoff and Mike Bordeaux will be.